because we have <coughs> a, we have a kitab here for it and that. Okay. okay. الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله بعد ذلك سفر 1845 corresponding to the 3rd 2023 الله سبحانه وتعالى سيز أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم الخبيثات للخبيثين والخبيثون للخبيثات والطيبات للطيبين والطيبون للطيبات أولئك مبرؤون مما يقولون لهم مغفرة ورزق كريم Bad statements do fit bad people and bad people are worthy of bad statements on the other hand, good statements are for good people, and good people are for good statements. Such are innocent, I mean the, the good people are innocent of every bad statement which people say about them. For these good people, there is forgiveness and honored revision. The goodness of Aisha because she is married to the best of mankind. Ibn Abbas explained al khabithat as the evil words. Usually this is ex- uh, understood as uh, bad women, and it's also a, uh, an explanation, as we'll see later. Bad women for bad men, and uh, good women for good men. Even our best explanation, however, is that khabithat uh, means evil words are for evil men. They deserve uh, evil talk about them because they are evil, and they do evil. And evil men are for evil words. Good words are for good men, and good men are for... Good word. This was revealed concerning Aisha and the people of the slander. This is also narrated from Mujahid. Ata bin Rabah, Sa'id bin Jubair, Shabi, Al Hassan bin Abu Al Hassan al Basri, Habib bin Abi Thabit, and Al Dahak. And it was also the view favored by Vinjali al Tabari. Vinjali al Tabari uh, <coughs> accepted this explanation of Nabas that. Khabithat al-Khabithin is evil words for evil men, etc. He interpreted it to mean that evil speech is more suited to evil people, and good speech is more suited to good people. But the hypocrites attributed to Aisha was more suited for them because they are evil people, and they are more worthy of uh, zina. And she was most suited to innocence and having nothing to do with them and what they accused her of. Such good people are innocent of every bad statement which these hypocrites say about them. The Rahman bin Zayd bin Aslam said, I am means evil women are for evil men, and evil men are for evil women. And good women are for good men, and good men are for good women. This also necessarily refers back to what they said, meaning the the Bad words to the Baraisha anha, <clears throat> because Allah would not have made Aisha anha, the wife of his messenger unless she had been good because he is the best of the best of mankind. If she had been evil, she would not have been a suitable partner either according to Allah's laws and decrees. Now, a question that arises is for example, we saw before in the beginning of this surah that. The companion Hilal ibn Umayyah, he was one of the three people that Allah forgave after they didn't go with the Prophet Salam to the Battle of Tabuk. So he was a companion and he was a good man. So how did uh, how did his wife cheat on him? In other words, he's good, then his wife should be good. Of course, this is uh, this is a uh, <coughs> this is uh, this is a question, a valid question that can arise. The answer is very simple. He was a companion. He's a good man. And while she was a good woman, she was his wife. But when she cheated on him, and she became an evil woman, uh, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala separated. 
between them through the li'an that they did in front of the Prophet ﷺ. Uh, therefore, uh, the man and the woman, they may be good at a certain point in the beginning of their relationship, and then after that, one of them may become evil. And at that point, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will separate them because as this ayah says, evil men are for evil women. So this, this is a question that a, you know, a person can, uh, can, uh, can have because they'll say, uh, you know, good men are for good women. So how come this woman cheated on, on her husband who's a companion? Well, as the scholars answered, while she was good, she was still his wife. When she cheated on him, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exposed her and they were separated uh, eternally through the li'an that they made in front of the Prophet So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Such people, Aisha anha, are innocent of every bad statement which they say. Meaning, they are remote from what the people of slander and enmity say. For them is forgiveness because of the lies that were told about them. An honored provision, provision with Allah in the gardens of the light and the hereafter. And this also is a promise from Allah to her, عنها, that she will be the wife of the Master وسلم, in paradise. Next Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal nadina amanu la tatkunu buyutan ghayra buyutikum hatta tasba'nisu wa tusallimu ala tahtiha thalikum khayrun lakum la'annakum tadakkarun fa in lam tajidu fiha ahadan fala tadkunuha hatta yu'dan lakum wa in qeena lakum urji'u farji'u wa azka lakum inna Allah khabirun bima yasna'un <clears throat> o you who believe, do not enter houses other than your own house until you have asked permission and greeted those in these houses that is better for you in order that you may remember. And if you find no one in these houses, still enter not until permission has been given to you. And if you are asked to go back, then go back because it is pure for you and Allah is all knower of what you do. There is no sin on you that you enter houses and inhabit it you have any interest in these inhabited houses, it means in case you have any interest in these inhabited houses, then there is no harm on you to enter to them like guest houses if the first permission was given to you and Allah has knowledge of what you reveal and what you conceal. <clears throat> Seeking permission and the etiquette of entering houses. This is the Islamic etiquette. Allah has taught these manners of seeking permission to his believing servants and commanded them. <clears throat> and commanded them not to enter houses other than their own houses until they had, asked, they had asked permission. That means they need to ask permission before entering these houses and to give the greeting of Islam. When they enter, they have to say, Salaamu Alaikum. One should seek permission three times. And if permission is given, he may enter. Otherwise, he should go away. As we will see in these following hadith. It was reported. It was reported in the Sahih that when Abu Musa asked Umar عنه, for permission three times,
Okay. Um, it's reported in the Sahih that when Abu Musa asked Omar three times for permission to enter, and he's not given permission, he went away. Then Omar said, did I not hear the voice of Abdullah bin Qais asking for permission to enter, let him come in. So he couldn't really hear him. Omar bin I did not hear Abu Musa. And that's why he, uh, he didn't let him come in. But after that, he doubted that um, Uh, he doubted that Abu Musa had come to him. That's why he sent back for him. But he had gone away. And then Umar Adina said, did I not hear the voice of Abdullah bin Qais asking for permission to answer? Let him come in. So they looked for him, but found that he had gone. When he came later on, Umar Adina said, why did you go away? In other words, you came, you asked permission, then you left. He... Uh, Abdullah bin Qais said, I asked for permission to enter three times, but permission was not given to me. And I heard the Prophet ﷺ said, If anyone of you asks for permission to enter a house three times and it's not given to him, then let him go away. But Umar said, you should certainly bring me evidence for this hadith or I shall beat you. In other words, Umar uh, heard a lot of hadith, but he never heard the Prophet ﷺ say this. So basically, he was afraid that this would be a lie. Uh, and he had, radiallahu anh, as we know, he was very tough in the truth. Uh, as opposed to the Muslims today, you know, if you are obeying Allah, they tell you you are an extremist. Uh, for them, if you disobey Allah, then you are a good Muslim. But if you obey Allah, you're an extremist. So Umar, radiallahu anh, and the Sahaba are our role model in how we should practice our religion. So uh, he said, bring me evidence for this hadith. So, Abdullah bin Qais went to a group of the Ansar and told them that Umar uh, wanted proof for the hadith that he told them. So they said, no one will give you testimony uh, except the youngest of us. So Abu Sa'id al-Khudri went with him. This is the youngest among the Ansar and told Umar about the hadith. So he testified that Far Salam said this hadith. So Umar said, what kept me from learning this hadith was my being busy in the marketplace. So he uh, accepted the hadith and said that Perhaps the reason why I didn't hear is that, you know, basically he was blaming himself for being in the marketplace. Obviously, he, it was necessary for him to do that as a means to support himself and his family. And of course, when they did that, the companions they did not do that with the uh, extremism that we uh, do life. So you want to talk about extremism is the way we live and the way uh, we are busy with dunya. Uh, so he had to go in the marketplace uh, once in a while, and he regretted that because he did not hear certain hadiths from Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Imam Ahmed Muhammad radiallahu anhu, uh, rahimahullah, recorded a narration stating that Anas bin Malik or someone else said the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asked for permission to enter upon Sa'd bin Ubada, who was the leader of the Khazraj. So the Prophet Islam said, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Uh, Sa'ad said, Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. But the Prophet Islam did not hear the return greeting from Sa'ad bin Ubada until he had given the greeting three times. And then since Sa'ad uh, did not return the greeting uh, in a loud voice, Since he did not give the, did not answer uh, in in a, a loud voice, uh, he alayhi salatu salam left. Uh, Sa'ad bin Ubad al responded in low voice. As we said, so the Prophet went back and Sa'ad followed him and said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, may father and mother be ransomed for you. You did not give any greeting except I responded to you, but I did not let you hear me respond back. Why? Because I wanted to get more of your salams and blessings. So he wanted the Prophet to tell him assalamu alaykum more than once because the dua of the Prophet is answered and he wanted to get more of his goodness. Then he called him back and he admitted him to his house and offered him some raisins. 
the Prophet ﷺ ate the raisins, and when he ﷺ finished, he said, "Akala ta'amakum al-abrar, wa sallat alaykum al-malaika, wa aftara indakum al-sa'imun." May the righteous eat your food. May the angels send blessings upon you, and may those who are fasting break their fast with you. So this is the etiquette uh, to say if someone offers you food. Uh, there are other types of du'a that uh, that is narrated in the Sunnah. This is one of them. It should also be known that the one who is seeking permission to enter should not stand directly in front of the door. In other words, don't knock on the door and stand in front of it because once the door opens, you may end up seeing what's behind the door and it's not something for you to see. So the etiquette is for you to uh, be either on the right or left of the door when you knock the door. And this is because of the hadith recorded by Abu Dawood from Abdullah bin Busr, who said when the Messenger of Allah وسلم, came to someone's door, he would never start stand directly in front of the door, but either to the right or to the left. So he وسلم, taught us the etiquette of every single thing. And subhanAllah, the Muslims today, they leave all these etiquettes that are rightly guided, that are revealed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they follow the misguided crooked ways of the kuffar thinking that the kuffar actually had uh, good etiquette and any good that they may have in their etiquettes uh, have no doubt about it that they got it from the muslims they got it from the muslims they adopted it for their ways of life so he alayhi salam would say assalamu alaikum assalamu alaikum uh, that was because at that time the houses had no covers or curtains to cover the doorways in other words, it's not like today where you have uh, door after door after door, but still, we should stick to this etiquette because houses are built differently and people's matters are uh, different. This report is recorded by Abu Dawood only. In the two Sahihs, Bukhari and Muslim, it is recorded that the Messenger of Allah said, لو أن مرأة نطرع عليك بغير إذن فخذفته بحصات ففقأت عينه ما كان عليك من جناح if a person looks into your house without your permission and you throw a stone at him and he puts his eye out, there will be no blame on you because he has uh, invaded your privacy inside your home. That's why the Prophet Salam is there another hadith that he was, uh, he was combing his hair and then when he turned, he saw an Arabi, a person, a Bedouin, uh, looking at him from the window and he said, if I saw you doing that before, I would have poked your eye. So these are etiquettes of what a person do. And obviously, you know, especially today with the, uh, the way things are built, you know, houses are next to each other, windows are facing each other. If you somehow are able to look into your neighbor's house, uh, don't do that. Don't do that if you're Allah. The group recorded that Jabir said, I came to the Prophet Salam with something that was owed to my father and knocked at the door. So he said, Man that. Who is that? So he, Jabir radiallahu anhu, said, me, me. He said, ana, ana. As if, oh, he said, I am. So he, alayhi salatu salam, said, ana, ana. I, I, as if he disliked it. In other words, who are you? Anyone, he's going to say me, but me doesn't give me information about who you are. So he, alayhi salam, did not like this answer, ana, ana, because this word, tells you nothing about who is saying it. Unless he clearly states his name or the name by which he is known, the nickname. Otherwise, everyone would call himself me. And it does not fulfill the purpose of asking permission to enter, which is to put people at their ease, as commanded in the ayah. Uh, also, you know, if a woman is at her home alone, she says, who is it? It says, me. So is it her brother? Is it her father? Or is it a stranger? Because if a stranger, she may not open the door. So you say, Anna, me. Who are you? Are you a close relative or are you a foreigner? So it does not fill the purpose of asking permission to enter, which is to put people at ease as commanded in the ayah. al awfi narrated from Ibn Abbas, putting people at ease means seeking permission to enter with others. Imam Ahmad recorded from Qalada bin al-Hanbal that at the time of the conquest of Mecca, Safwan bin Umayyah sent him with milk a small gazelle and small cucumbers when the Prophet Islam was at the top of the valley. So he said, I entered upon the Prophet and I did not give the greeting of Salam, nor did I ask permission to enter. So the Prophet said, 
ارجع فقل السلام عليكم ادخل go back and say السلام عليكم may I enter so here similarly when we teach our kids that when they enter home they have to come bismillah and when they enter say السلام عليكم if they don't do that you tell him go back out and then come back inside the house and say that lest shaitan may enter with you so he, he alayhi salatu salam said ارجع فقل السلام عليكم ادخل go back and say السلام عليكم may I enter this was after Safwan had become Muslim. This is also recorded by Abu Dawood at Tirmidhi and Nasai. At Tirmidhi said this hadith is Hassan Ghadib. Ibn Juraj said that he heard Ata bin Rabah narrating that Ibn Abbas, may Allah be pleased with them, said there are three ayat whose rulings people neglect. So three ayat that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking about the Quran that people neglect. Number one, inna akramakum wa Allahi atqaakum. Verily, the most honorable of you with Allah is the one who has the most taqwa. But now, this is their time. Sahab say, but now, they say that the most honorable of them with Allah is the one who has the biggest house. I personally have, have a problem in the Muslim land with this problem. You know, people, when they see you having a beard and wearing a kameez, they automatically assume that you are uneducated, that you could achieve nothing in life, and that's why you went to learn the Quran. Because to them, learning the Quran is easy, but learning some uh, worldly knowledge, like an engineer or a doctor, something is different. And even sometimes when I'm going at work, they ask me for my ID card. Recently, I think it was just a week ago, a security guard that was coming back from Friday prayer, Security guard asked me, uh, yes, how can I help you? I'm entering like uh, the complex of work. I told him, are there any banks here that I can rob? So he started laughing. And I'm like, of course, I'm coming to work. I said, here's my ID card, but make sure you ask everyone for his ID card. And that means don't ask me only because I have a beard. And then when someone comes in, you know, shaving his beard like, like a, a little girl or uh, hanging himself with a tie and wearing a, a, a suit and a tie, uh, don't let your don't let yourself be scared of him, and don't ask him for his ID. In other words, be man enough to ask him what they like you ask me. So this is a problem that we have today in the Muslim land. Somehow the Muslims were brainwashed into thinking that people of religion are people who are backwards and people who amount to nothing and couldn't achieve anything in this dunya. And the opposite actually is true. So Subhanallah, you look at this. This is at the top of the companions. They're saying that. Actually, more the tabi'een, they said, Inna akramakum inda Allahi atqakum. People don't care about this anymore. All they care about is if you have a big house or you have a big uh, uh, big car or something, then you are the one who is uh, who has more honorable in the eyesight of people because people are ignorant. And of course, with some, we need to show them their mistake. With some, we need to just overlook their ignorance. Number two, as for seeking permission, the people have forgotten all about that. In other words, the second mistake people do is that they just come and enter the house. So I said, the, 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 uh, the narrative continues, should I seek permission to enter upon my orphan sisters who are living with me in my house? He said, yes. I asked him to make allowances for me, but he refused. And I said, do you want to see them naked? Do you want to see your sisters naked? I said, no. He said, then ask permission to enter. I asked him again, and he said, do you want to obey Allah? I said, yes. He said, then ask for permission before entering upon your orphan sisters. Ibn Jurai said, Ibn Tawus told me that his father said, there are no women whom I hate to see naked in those homes. He was very strict on this point. Ibn Zuhri said, Ibn Shurahbil, Ibn Shrahbil al Audi and Ta'ama say that he heard Ibn Saud say, You have to seek permission to enter upon your mothers. Ibn Juray said, I said to Ata, Does a man have to seek permission to enter upon his wife? He said, No. It can be understood that this is not obligatory to seek permission to enter upon your wife because even if you see her naked, it's, she's your wife. But of course, it's better for him to let her know that he's coming uh, as to not startle her in what she's doing because sometimes she may be changing her pad or you know something like that that she doesn't want her husband to see her she doesn't want her husband to see her and that's why it's better 
for him to uh, warn her that he's coming. Abu Ja'far bin Jalil narrated from the nephew of Zainab, the wife of Abdullah bin Mas'ud, that Zainab, to be pleased with her, said, and Abdullah came back from some errand, reached the door, he would clear his throat and spit, because he would suddenly and find us in a state that he disliked. So basically he would uh, <coughs> go like this, clear his throat, and spit, so basically he's making noise, they know that he's coming in. Next, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, do not enter houses other than your own house unless you seek permission unless seek permission and greet it People in those houses. Muqati bin Hayyan said, during the Jahiliyyah, when a man met his friend, he would not greet him with salam. Now, this is an important point. In Jahiliyyah, before Islam, when a man met his friend, he would not greet him with salam. Rather, he would say, Huyita sabahan or Huyita nasa'an, which is equivalent to what? Good morning, good evening. So those Muslims that meet each other and say good morning, good evening, they are living in a Jahiliyyah. As Muslims say, salam. And as Father Hassan said, the Jews are jealous people. And one of the things that they are jealous about is our salam. So a Muslim should greet his brother, or a Muslim should greet her sister with the salam. This is the greeting among the people at that time. They did not seek permission to enter one another's house. In other words, a man may walk straight into somebody's house and say, I have come in, I'm inside, and so on. So, of course, this is a difficult situation for a man to bear because he might be with his wife, sleeping with her, or, you know, his wife may be taking a shower and her husband is not there. So, you know, it's a strange man that comes in and is like, oh, I'm inside. Well, so that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught us the right etiquette to do things. You say salam, you knock, you ask permission three times. If no answer, then you leave. <clears throat> so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala changed all that by enjoining, covering, and chastity, making it pure and free of any sin or impropriety. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, yeah, Oh, you who believe do not enter houses other than your own house until you have asked permission and greeted those people in these houses. But Muqatil said is good. I said, that is better for you, meaning seeking permission to enter is better for you because it is better for both parties. The one who is seeking permission to enter and the people inside the house, and know that you may remember so that you are, uh, you are not heedless or you are mindful of these things because for you, uh, there is no problem to enter upon people, but the people who are there, they may have many problems, you being inside their house. And if I ask to go back, then go back. It is pure. In other words, you ask for Mr. and someone else, and he says, oh, you know what, I'm busy now. Then leave. Don't stay there and say, oh, why you don't let me in, it, sir? Because when he says it, he has his own reasons, and it's better for you not to uh, continue pushing the issue because you may have a problem with the owner of the house. So it's people for you to go back if you are told to go back. And if a person tells you to go back, uh, you have to feel happy. Say, oh, alhamdulillah, I have a chance to obey Allah because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِنْ قِيلَ لَكُمْ وَرْجِعُوا فَرْجِعُوا لَكُمْ So don't hold a grudge against the person and say, oh, you know, he's impolite, he didn't let me in, etc. Because you don't know what situation he's in. Maybe he's fighting with his, with his uh, family members or something like that. So it's better for you not to see him in that state. So go back. It is pure for you. Meaning going back is pure and better for you. And Allah is all know of what you do. I thought I said that one of the emigrants said, all my life I try to follow this ayah. 
But if I asked permission to enter upon one of my brothers and he asked me to go back, I could not do so happily. Although Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that if you are asked to go back, then go back. It is pure for you. For Allah is all nowhere what you do. And if you are asked to go back, go back. Sayyid Juba said, this means do not stand at people's door. Okay, so he asked permission to enter. He says, I'm busy now. I'll call you later. I'll come get you later. Don't stand there in front of the door. So, of course, it may be difficult on the person uh, to be sent back. But as we said, uh, reverse that uh, evil feeling, ill feeling that shaitan throws in your heart. Uh, with a good feeling that Allah gave you a chance to obey Him. Next, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Laisa alaykum junahun anta dhuna bayyot an ayat masjid." There is no sin on you that you enter houses that are uninhabited. This ayah is more specific than the one that comes before it because it states that it is permissible to enter houses where there is nobody. If one has reason, of course, for doing so which has houses that are prepared for guests. This doesn't mean that, you know, that some people are traveling and they say, Allah tells me I have the right to go inside this house. No, it's not the meaning. The meaning, if you have reason to go inside this house uh, and if prior permission is given to you, like uh, guest houses. So if permission has been given to you once, this is sufficient. You're not going to come and ask the host every time to give you permission to enter. So, for example, in the Muslim land, uh, there are some, you know, people that live in multi-story uh, houses, so they may have the lower floor for guests. So, you know, when the guests come in, they welcome them the first day, and the guests maybe they're gonna stay for three days. They give them the key. They say there, or, you know, take your uh, take the liberty to go in and out as you wish. So, of course, when the person goes and comes back, he doesn't have to uh, bother the the host and say, "Oh, I come back. Am I allowed to come in because Allah told me?" That I need to ask permission. Yeah, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says that there is no sin on you to enter houses uh, that don't have people in it, such as guest houses, provided that prior permission was given to you. Ibn Abbas said this ayah: "Do not enter houses other than your own." Uh, this was abrogated, and an exception was made. In other words, Allah says, "Enter houses, accept your houses." This is a general instruction. And a portion of it was ab abrogated by this other ayah uh, that, you know, in the case of houses that are not inhabited and uh, you have a certain type of interest in these houses, as we said, as being a guest, for example, or something that you left in that house, you know, your own uh, furniture, for example, you left it in, in a certain house and you're going back to, to get it. Next, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قُلْ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ يَغُضُّوا مِنْ أَدْصَارِهِمْ وَيَحْفَظُوا فُرُوجَهُمْ ذَلِكَ أَزْكَى لَهُمْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ قَبِيرٌ بِمَا يَصْنَعُونَ Tell the believing men to lower their gaze and protect their private parts. There is pure for them. Verily, Allah is all aware of what they do. The command to lower the gaze, this is a command from Allah to his believing servants. To lower their eyes from looking at things that have been forbidden for them. As we said yesterday, uh, the eyesight is the wide open door for shaitan's poisoned arrow to hit your heart. So eyes more than, than any other quality is the one that impacts the heart. And as we said, most of the time, if you're looking around, you're not trying to lower your gaze, you're going to see something you like. Like in the case of men, um, in the case of men, they may see good-looking women many times here and there. He has no way to reach these women. He has no way to be with them. So what happens is that his heart is just going to become sick with this disease of lust. Because he's seeing things that he can't reach. So you're not going to be able to achieve what you want unless you're doing it in a haram way, in most cases. So therefore... Don't open the door for shaitan to invade you. Lower your gaze. You should only look at what is permissible for you to look at and lower the gaze from the forbidden things, including, of course, the phones, TV, etc. If it so happens that a person's gaze unintentionally falls upon something forbidden, he should quickly look away because the first look 
you are not uh, punished on because you did not mean to look for. Of course, provided that you always try to not look at haram things. But if you, you know, wandering with your eyes right and left, you're about to see something haram, then you are going to be, uh, it's going to be counted as a sin against you because you are not uh, seeking to avoid it. You are looking for it. Muslim recorded in Sahih that Jari ibn Abdullah al Bajali, may Allah be pleased with him, said, I asked the Prophet about the southern glance. That means, you know, you turn around the corner, for example, and you see some uh, dressed naked woman. Well, dressed naked is Kasiyat Ariyat, which is what's rampant today in the Muslim land. I don't know where is people's minds, I don't know where are the men who are responsible for these women. Everywhere we go in the Muslim land, we see women becoming more and more naked. Uh, they don't fear Allah. The laws allow them to do that. Their uh, male family members are useless. They're not doing their, their tasks that Allah ordered them to do. So we are bound to look in a single day at tens, if not hundreds, of cases where we see some woman dressed in the proper way. But the glass. Uh, is not counter against you. That's why the Prophet uh, told uh, Ijab ibn Abdullah al-Bajari to turn his eye away from the haram thing. Then Sahih is narrated that Abu Sa'id al-Khudri said that the Mizr of Allah said, Iyakum wa jilusa ala turuqat, we were of sin in the streets. They said, on Mizr of Allah, we have no alternative but to sit in the streets to converse with another. And uh, this can be understood uh, nowadays by sitting in coffee shops. Sitting in coffee shops, especially the ones that have uh, coffee shops or restaurants, they have uh, tables in the street where people get to look at people coming in and out. That's sitting in the streets. So uh, he as well them, said, beware of sitting in the streets. They said, on Messenger of Allah, we have no alternative but to sit in the streets to converse with one another. So he said, in If you insist on sitting in the streets, then give the street its rights. They said, What are the rights of the street? Or Mazar of Allah, he said, If you must sit in the streets, then lower your gaze, return the green of salam, enjoy what is good and forbid what is evil. Uh, Abu Qasim al we recorded that Abu Umama said, I heard the Messenger of Allah وسلم, said, the Messenger of Allah وسلم, said, Ikfulu li sitan, akfulu lakum fil jannah. Ida haddatha ahadukum fala yakrib, wa ida tumina fala yakun, wa ida wada fala yukhlif, wa huddu absarakum, wa kufu aidiyakum, wa hafadu furujakum. Guarantee me. Six things, and I will guarantee you paradise. When any one of you speaks, he should not lie. If he is trusted with something, he should not betray that trust. If he makes a promise, he should not break it. Lower your gaze, restrain your hands, and protect your private parts. Since looking provokes the heart to evil, Allah commanded the believers to protect their private parts just as he commanded them to protect their gaze, which could lead to that. So he said, Tell the believing men to lower their gaze and protect their private parts. Sometimes protecting the private parts may involve keeping them from committing zina. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ لِفْرُونَهِمْ حَافِظُونَ And those who guard their chastity. Sometimes they may involve not looking at certain things. As in the hadith in Muslim Ahmad and the Sunan. اِحْفَظْ عَوْرَتَكَ إِلَّا مِنْ زَوْجَتِكَ أَوْ مَا مَلَكَ تَمِينُكَ Guard your private parts except from your wife and those whom your right hand possesses. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created man and created man with the ability to be with four wives plus slave girls at the same time because this is how Allah SWT created us but of course uh, as you know the kuffar today uh, they have imposed laws 
that, uh, of course, after they abolished slavery, they imposed laws to either criminalize polygamy or making it difficult to impossible so that uh, divorce can become rampant and zina can become rampant. And they have succeeded. They have succeeded in the most part. And we seek refuge with Allah from falling into their plots. So Allah SWT says, There is pure for them, meaning it is pure for their hearts and better for their commitment to religion. As it was said, whomever protects his gaze, Allah will eliminate his understanding or his heart. This is Ibn Qayyim said that. That if you lower your gaze, Allah will illuminate your heart and your understanding. You will be able to understand the religion better. As is narrated uh, that the Shafi'i said, Shakautu ila waki'in su'ahifli fa'arashadani ila taqil ma'asi. I complained to Akiya that I, it became difficult for me to, to learn. So he told me, leave the sins. Of course, when you talk about sins for people who Allah has guided, like the Shafi'i or the other Imams, these sins may be things that for us is a, a normal uh, way of life. So here, by lowering your gaze, as we said, you protect your heart from the poisoned arrows of Satan, and as a result, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will illuminate your heart with the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the light of faith, the light to understand the religion. And that's what Ibn Qayyim Allah, said, because he said after these ayat, or the instructions, as we will see uh, next week, inshallah, Allah mentions that he is a nur, the light of the heavens and earth. So he, uh, Allah understood from the ayat and the order of these ayat that if you do that, lower your gaze and for the woman to uh, dress correctly wearing her proper hijab, not not showing, uh, you know, whatever Allah bestowed on her from uh, body parts that may attract or will, for a fact, attract men. If the woman does that, Allah will eliminate her heart. Allah will eliminate her heart. So uh, women have to understand that uh, covering their outside will cause their hearts to eliminate with the faith. So if they feel that they don't have faith, if they feel that uh, it becomes, it's becoming more and more difficult for them to obey Allah's commands, then let them look at the way they dressed. Because scholars such as Ibn Baz, rahimahullah, said, that if you see a woman not dressed properly, not wearing her hijab properly, if you see a woman not wearing her hijab properly, then do know that Allah is angry with her. Let me repeat this because it's very important and there's proof from the Quran. If you see a woman not dressed properly, then that means that Allah is angry with her. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, about Adam and Hawa, that after they disobeyed him, Allah caused their clothes to fall from them and their aura was shown. So, this is a very important message to the sisters. If you feel yourself that you are starting to wear clothes that are tighter and tighter, shorter and shorter, showing portions of your hair, then do know that you are going in the wrong way. Repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, seek forgiveness, cover your outside, and Allah will put the faith back in your heart. So subhanAllah, the scholars that bring things like that, they understand from the Quran. So back here, Allah SWT says, Inna Allah khabirun bima yasna'un. Verily, Allah is all aware of what they do. This is like the ayah, Ya'lamu khainat al-a'yuni wa ma'atukhfi al-sudur. Allah knows the fraud of the eyes and all that the breasts conceal. In the Sahih, it is recorded that Abu Hurairah, radiallahu anhu, said that the Messenger of Allah said, 
كتب على ابن آدم حظه من الزنا أدرك ذلك لا محالة فزنا العينين النظر وزنا اللسان النطق وزنا الأذنين الاستماع وزنا اليدين البطش وزنا الرجلين الخطى والنفس تمنى وتشتهي والنفس تمنى وتشتهي والفرج يصدق ذلك أو يكذبه The son of Adam has his share of zina decreed for him. And he will commit that which has been decreed. The zina of the eyes is to look at haram things. The zina of the tongue is to speak to non-mahram girls, for example, or to speak uh, evil things. The zina of the ears is listening to what is haram. The zina of the hands is striking in an unjust way. The zina of the feet is walking towards committing sins. The soul wishes and desires, so Allah created the soul, and the private parts either confirm that desire of the soul or denies that. Because as we said, the person may look, keep looking here and there, and every time he's seeing beautiful girls, he has no way to uh, get married to them. So either he'll try to commit zina with them or will try to, as we said, as an example, is do magic so he can separate a girl from a woman from her husband so he can get married to her. So uh, the person should not follow the footsteps of shaitan as we saw yesterday. Uh, and looking and listening and talking are footsteps that will lead to zina, na qadrallah. It was recorded by Al-Bukhari without a complete chain of narration. Muslim recorded similar report with a different chain of narration. Many of the Salaf said they used to forbid men from staring at beardless, handsome boys because even looking at boys uh, and staring at them for a long period of time is reason for shaitan to encourage them to commit homosexuality with these uh, boys because these boys they don't have beards, so they kind of look like women, and that's how men that shamelessly shave their beards, you know, they look more like women. And that's why, you know, these small steps led to what's major, which is homosexuality, to the point that it became rampant, and then people start saying, oh, I was created like this. No, you were not created like that. You were created a Hanif. But because you did not lower your gaze, because you did not do what Allah told you, you start to like men because shaitan has inhabited your heart. So this is this, you know, these are small things that people when you talk to people about, they say, Well, it's not really a big thing. Well, now it's not a big thing, but it will lead to a bigger thing with time. Next Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wa kunin mu'minati yaqbudna min And tell the believing women to lower their gaze and protect their private parts and not to show off their beauty, their adornments, the jewelry, except that which is apparent. Uh, Carl said, clothing is what is apparent. And to draw their veils all over their juyub, which is the opening of the upper opening of the garment, that's the shape, and not to reveal their adornment except to their husbands, their fathers, or their husbands' fathers, or their sons, or their husbands' sons, or their brothers, or their brothers' sons, or sisters' sons, or their women, or Muslim women, or their right, or what their right hand possesses, 
or the tabi'in among men who do not have desire or children who are not aware of the nakedness of women. In other words, they wouldn't know the difference between men and women. And let them not stamp their feet so as to reveal what they hide of their adornment. And all of you beg Allah to forgive you, all believers, so that you may be successful. The rulers of hijab, this is a command from Allah to the believe in women and jealousy on his part over the wives of his believing servants. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he ordered women to cover themselves, because Allah is jealous that these women would show their beauty to non-mahram men, and Allah's jealousy is for his instructions to be disobeyed. And obviously, when a person is a believer and his heart is full of good faith, when he sees a woman not dressed properly, he feels angry. Because she, even though she may not be related to him by blood, she is uh, a sister in Islam. Of course, we don't talk about the kuffar, because the kuffar is, you know, nakedness is the least of their problems. I mean, there's no sin more uh, greater than, than polytheism. So when we talk about Muslim women here, when, when a person has faith in his heart and he sees the woman naked, of course he feels angry. He feels angry at the men, her men folk, who are responsible for her, who are not stopping her from showing her beauty to non mahram He's angry because this woman is following in the footsteps of shaitan. And he's angry because this woman is the cause of fitna to other men. As Farah Salam said, from Fani min ahli narran arhumabad. There are two types of people among the Muslims that do not exist at the time of the Prophet Wasallam. One of them is, uh, you know, he's, he's describing the uh, soldiers or the police force of unjust rulers who have uh, whips that they hit people with unjustly. And the second type are Nisa Kasiya Tariyat, women who are dressed and yet naked. What does that mean, dressed and yet naked? Like the pants that we see today. It's so tight on her body that, you know, as a matter of fact, she may even look better uh, with the pants than she would look naked. Because the pants, you know, puts up her, her, her body shape. Uh, so they have clothes on, but they are naked because they are showing the shape of their bodies and the beauty of their bodies. Ma'ilat mumilat, as far as I'm said, the way they walk, is they swing right and, and left, you know, like walking in a sexy way. Why? Mumilat, so that they can swing the hearts of men from halal to haram, from goodness to evil, from marriage to zina. Because, you know, a man, Allah created him weak. This is in reference to women. As Ibn Tawu said, Tawu Sunna Tabi'in explained this ayah, means if a man sees a woman, he has no patience to not sleep with her. So this woman is doing that. The Prophet Muhammad continues, ma'ilat wa milat. You know, they walk, they walk in a swinging way, you know, and then they cause the hearts of men to swing from truth to, uh, to evil, from uh, goodness to, to zina, etc. Il'anuhunna fa'innahunna mal'unat. Curse them because they are cursed because of what they're doing. Their acts cause men to swear away from Allah's path and they may commit zina la qadar with them and they may have children of zina in the society who are the followers of the jal who are good for nothing as Ibn Qayyim said the child of zina is made from a nutfa khabitha from an evil drop of sperm and usually a person of zina usually as we said he is bound to do evil he is bound to commit evil because his this, the essence of his creation is evil. Now there may be exceptions, but this is the this is the the, the, the normal case. There may be exceptions, but his normal case. But of course, if this son of Zina uh, wants goodness, Allah will guide him. But usually, a person who is born out of Zina, the sacrifice with Allah from that, uh, is bound to do evil things. So these women, they are causing all this evil because of the way they dress. And Swar Parasam said, curse them, they are cursed. They will not enter Jannah, nor will they smell the smell of Jannah. That means not only would they will not enter Jannah, they will not even get close to a Jannah. 
even though the smell of Jannah can be smelled from very far away. Okay? So he alayhi salatu salam is telling us, so when you see a Muslim woman like that, first of all, what is the man responsible for? Allah will punish him. Allah will punish him. Allah will put that in his own uh, uh, family. If this is his sister and he doesn't care about the way she dresses, his wife and his daughters will end up being in that. So Muslim men should fear Allah. And even if you have to fight with your sister or your mother or your daughter, then do it because Allah put you in that position. You have to force them. You have to overpower shaitan. You have to overpower their shaitan. You have to force them to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But of course, if you live in the kafir land, you cannot even force yourself to do something, let alone force them. So basically, if you have the ability to do that without causing harm to yourself, then do it. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the believing women to cover themselves. This is also distinguish them, these believing women, from the women of the jahiliyyah and the deed of the pagan, pagan women. So as we said, the women were not dressed properly. They are women of jahiliyyah. They are following the first of the women of jahiliyyah and they're also imitating the slave girls. They have personality of a slave girl because a free woman, even in jahiliyyah, would not commit zina. She would not uh, give herself to a man except with the due rights. The reason for the revelation of this ayah was mentioned by Muqatil bin Hayyan when he said, we heard, and Allah knows best, that Jari bin Abdullah al-Ansari narrated that Asma bin Murshida was in the house, was in a house of hers in Bani Haritha, and the women started coming in to her without their lower garments so that the ankles on their feet could be seen along with their chests and forelocks. Asma, Asma said how ugly this is because this is how women are. They, they have half a brain, you know, like they want to look beautiful. They don't think about anything else. You know, they just want to look beautiful. So of course the man who was in charge of these women has to uh, show them what's right. So when that happened, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed this ayah, وَقُلِ الْمُؤْمِنَاتِ يَغْضُضْنَ مِنْ أَبَصَادِهِنَّ Until the believing women to lower their gazes. And Allah, until the believing women to lower their gaze, meaning from that which Allah has forbidden them to look at. Also the aura of the Muslim woman to a Muslim woman is like the aura of a Muslim, of a Muslim woman to a mahram. Uh, in some uh, ignorant uh, country, people think that the aura of the one for a woman is just uh, the aura mughallada, what's under the, the underwear. So they go to the bathhouses and they, they are naked next to each other. This is haram. Going to the bathhouse is haram in itself. As the Prophet said, if anyone believes in, the, in Allah and the, and the last day, do not let him send his uh, woman to the hammam. So, you know, not only are male jinn there that take advantage of these women by looking at them and uh, Aggressing them, as I personally saw in the case of some women who were inhabited by jinn to go into the hammam because you know, men, jinn, they like men, human beings. They see a girl or a woman that is good looking, that's sexy, that's it. They, they want to be with her, uh, they commit dinner with her, and they enter her. Uh, and then, you know, sometimes she sees dreams at night that someone is sleeping with her, and it's actually the jinn who sleeps with her. Why? Because she disobeyed Allah and went to the hammam. So she's paying the price and her husband should fear Allah as well. Otherwise, he is sharing his wife with the jinn because he is not obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by sending his wife to the hammam. Uh, so some scholars said that it is permissible for women to look at non mahram men without desire. As is recorded in the Sahih that the Messenger of Allah was watching the Ethiopians playing with spears in the masjid on the day of Eid. And Aisha, the mother of the believers, was watching them from behind him, and he was concealing her from them until she got bored and went away. Number one, this was Eid. It's an exception. In, in Eid, there are exceptions, like uh, watching the, uh, the Ethiopians play with their spears, uh, just like watching a show, okay? Uh, for uh, women to sing and play with the duf, this is only in Eid. So people should not take this and say, Aisha did this, so we're going to do it every day. Every day we're going to watch movies, every day we're going to watch shows, every day we're going to do this. And we say it's, we're going to look at men every day. And we say, because actually then I did that, at Bar Salaam didn't say anything. It was Eid. If you do it from Eid to Eid, you have stuck to the Sunnah. If you do beyond that, 
you are you are following the footsteps of shaitan so that's why of course you know as we said the same way that men uh, desire women women desire men it's normal i mean we look at uh, surah yusuf all those women plus the wife of the aziz they all wanted to sleep with yusuf because he was good looking mashallah and when a woman sees a good looking man it's normal for her to to want to be with him you know of course if it's not if it's not for the fear of allah or, or, or something else of course in other words that's why when a man goes to get married to a woman and she looks at him and she likes the way he looks she, she accepts to get married to him because usually you know she she looks at him as a man right so the same when men desire women women desire men therefore both men and women should lower their gazes this is the meaning of Anisa uh, Shaqaiq or Rijal. The uh, women, women are the sisters of men. It means in Ahkam, in the rules, in the regulations. Men lower their gaze, women lower their gaze. This doesn't mean that if man goes to work, the woman needs to work. Uh, if the man is able to have four wives, the woman is able to have four husbands. Because people that say that, this is what they mean, right? No, they are similar in ahkam, in what's halal haram. Okay? They both are ordered to follow Allah's laws. They both will be punished if they disobey Allah. They will both be rewarded if they obey Allah, men and women. This is the meaning of anisa shaykh rijal. Some, some deviant people, you know, they try to please the kuffar by saying, oh, we have in the religion this. So that means, you know, the woman should inherit the same as the man. She should work. She should do this. She should do that. This is wrong. So here, as we said, it was day of Eid. It's an exception in Eid because twice a year a person can do these things. But if you do it in, in every day, it is haram. And protect their private parts. So Yalla Sahantara says the same thing, that for men and women, lower their gaze and protect private parts. Why? Because if you don't lower your gaze, you will not be able to protect your private part. For both men and women. Sa'id bin Jubayr said, from immoral actions. Abu al-Aliya said, every ayah of the Qur'an in which protecting the private part is mentioned means protecting them from zina. Except for the ayah, protect their private parts, which means protect them even from being seen by anybody. And not to show off their adornments, except that which is apparent, meaning they should not show anything of their adornment, that means jewelry, to non-mahram men, except for whatever it is impossible to hide, Ibn Mas'ud said, such as clothes and outer garments. So of course, the outer garment, the woman has to put it on when she leaves, and this is also considered part of the zina. Yeah, and then the proof of that is, khudu zina takumain takulli masjid. It says that, take your, unify yourselves at every time you pray salah, that means wear your clothing. Meaning what the Arab women used to wear of the veil, which covered their clothes and whatever showed from underneath the outer garment. So usually, you know, you have the the veil from outside, like in Morocco, they used to have uh, something called the hayek. It was white color and something that would cover all the clothing. In Iran today, you see their women, how they do like the, the, the black veil over all their bodies except the eye. But of course, when they walk, sometimes you can see some pants from under the clothing or something like that. But of course, a woman should try hard to not show it. I see women do the opposite. You know, when they put that veil and then they open it from the middle and then you can see all of their inside clothing, right? So you see they're wearing jeans, they're wearing uh, tight sweaters. And then they say, well, I, I put my veil on. Yeah, but you should, you denim. That means make your veil close to your body. So, that means the, uh, the the clothes and whatever shows from underneath outer garment, no harm on them uh, because it is something that she cannot conceal. She cannot conceal. But of course, if she can conceal it, there is sin on her. If she can conceal her inner clothing and then she does not conceal them, then there is sin on her. Similar to that is what appears of her lower garments and what she cannot conceal. Like sometimes when she walks, the bottom of her uh, pants may, may show. Or for example, the uh, the boots, if she's wearing boots. And to throw their veils over their genuine meaning that they should wear the outer garments in such a way as to cover their chests and ribs that they will be different from the women of the Jahiliyyah. 
who did not do that, but would pass in front of men with their chests completely and covered, and with their necks, forelocks, hair, and earring and covered. So to the Muslim women that are dressed like that, you are imitating your sisters from al Jahiliyyah. So Allah commanded the belief in women to cover themselves and not to be like the women of Jahiliyyah. So when a woman does that, she can't claim that she has faith. Because if she had faith, she would have obeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told Prophet Salam, Ya ayyuhal nabi, yukul ni azwa jika banatika wa nasa wa nisa il mu'minin yudnina alayhinna min jalabi bihin thanika adana an yu'arafna fala yu'zayin to prophesy your wives and your daughters and the women of the believers, not only for the Prophet Salam, but also the women of the believers, to draw their cloaks all over their bodies. Al-Jilbab is what covers from top to the bottom. That would be better, that they should be known as free women that do not commit fornication and they're not slave girls, so that they're not annoyed, so that men don't try to follow them to commit zina with them, because free women don't commit zina. And that's why slave girls were ordered to show their faces, to not imitate the uh, free women. And Umar Dana used to strike them if they, if the slave girls covered uh, their faces, because they were imitating free women, and then they, would, they may end up committing zina, and then men would think, oh, free women commit zina as well, and that's, that's a bad thing for society. So that would be better that these women would be known as free women, so, not, so they're not annoyed. And also in this ayah, Allah SWT says, control their khumur, their veils over their juyub. Khumur veil is the plural of khimar, which means something that covers and is what is used to cover the head. So it covers the head and also it's used to cover the face as Aisha Anha narrated when she was in Hajj. This is what is known among the people as a veil at the time. So we should not take the uh, understanding of what the veil is today and say this is what the ayah means. So like the veil sometimes is the hijab, something that is that covers only the hair and the neck. That's not the veil that is mentioned here. Said and Jubay said, and to draw pull it around and tie it securely. We said, open it from the middle and show everything that's underneath it. So pull it around you and tie it securely. Their veils all over their view means their necks and chest. We said the jade is the upper and uh, opening, the upper clothing, uh, the upper opening of the clothing next to the neck. So juyub means over their necks. So they put these khimar over their necks and chest so that nothing can be seen of them. Al-Bukhari records that Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, said, may Allah have mercy on the women of the early immigrants. When Allah revealed this ayah, when to draw their veils all over their juyub, they tore their aprons right away. And, and they ikhtamar themselves with them. That means they used them as khimar. They covered uh, whatever was shown from uh, their necks or their hair or their face or, or their chest because the uh, sahabiyat they used to be very quick to obey Allah's command unlike the Muslim women today may Allah guide them we also learned from Safiya bint Shayba that Aisha anha used to say when this ayah was revealed and to draw their veils all over their shuyub was revealed they took their izars, which is the waist sheet, and tore them at the edges, and they khtamar themselves with them. So we'll stop here, inshallah. Uh, we ask Allah to teach us the beneficial knowledge. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to save us from much and tribulations. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring back the Muslim to path, especially the women and the youth among them, and make them, make them all the Muslims gather around the single leader that will lead them to establish Allah's law and truth and justice in this world. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make the best day of our existence the day that we meet him. And finally, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to gather us from Allah in the highest place of the dose. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, Jazakum Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, Jazakum Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, Jazakum Alhamdulillah,